Hello, Mage fans. This is Adam Simpson with Mage the Podcast, and we've got a great show for you today. First, I have a few announcements. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that I have been working on the Anders Mage Page 2.0 project. That is a website that uh, presents material from Anders Mage Page from the 90s. I've spoken about it a few times on the show. That project is complete. It is free. No advertisements. Available for all. I encourage Mage fans to take a look. Uh, I'm confident you'll find something that will spark some ideas. And that can be found at mage.gearsonline.net. Uh, you should find the link there easily. I'll try to put that link into the show notes to make it even easier. And, you know, related to that, I have a request uh, for all you listeners out there. Uh, Paul Strack was a contributor to uh, Anders Mage Page back in the 90s, uh, put in a lot of interesting pieces, um, a lot of which were praised by Anders Sonberg himself. If uh, Paul Strack, Strack is listening or anyone who knows him, uh, please let him know that he can contact Mage the Podcast at gmail.com and uh, just put in a request to talk to Adam. I would just love to talk to him and uh, hear what he has to say about Anders Mage Page and Mage the Ascension. Now today I am joined by co-host Terry Robinson. Uh, he is a mage fan, a mage storyteller. He's got a lot to say on the subject. Uh, welcome Terry. Howdy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're uh, pleased to have you on as a co-host. Uh, I spoke with Terry uh, last week, and uh, we had a lot of ideas for uh, the podcast and uh, specifically about the progenitors, so I'm, I'm really happy that he's able to join us today. Now, one thing we always do with uh, new guests and co-hosts on the show is we like to know, uh, how did you get into tabletop role-playing games? I got into tabletop role-playing games in the same way that I think most boys get into most group activities. They saw someone else do it, and they wanted to do it too, almost regardless of what the activity is. That's how I got into. Uh, that's how I got into trading card games. That's how I got to like poking myself with sharp sticks. A anything a young boy can get into. Um, I started out with Dungeons and Dragons. That was my gateway system. Um, I guess that started when I was in sixth grade at summer camp, and just the idea of being able to run around and hit things with swords um, was pretty great. Um, one day I was in my local um, gaming store and I saw the Vampire the Masquerade, I guess it was second edition or revised, whatever the iconic green marble with the rose on top of it was. I grabbed that, I read through it, I thought it was an interesting system. And then that was the sole thing they had with a few other vampire supplements. I was at a much larger game store for a Star Wars trading card game. Um, tournament because that's how cool I am and the uh, the purple elegance of uh, made second edition called to me I bought it and I absolutely shotgunned it um, I think I got home that night after the tournament maybe around 10 I, I stayed up reading until 2 and like all good made storytellers I waited another three years before in any way trying to write a chronicle um, <laughs> the, <laughs> It is it is a bizarre and daunting system, and this was, I guess it would have been like 1998, so I remember stumbling upon Anders' mage page and being like, who is this crazy man? Um, especially when you come upon your first, I guess you could say, fan or community-driven version of the Marauders as like, I don't know, a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old, you're like, what is this even? Um, and it just kind of went from there. I ran Chronicles in high school. I ran them. I worked at a summer camp for a number of years. That was a, a great environment to, uh, to be able to run a Chronicle where you knew everyone's schedule every week, which made scheduling real easy. Um, I ran a few in college, and about a year and a half ago, um, I realized that uh, RPGs weren't just for kids, and uh, a bunch of my friends, all of us in our mid-30s with, with mortgages and, and spouses and sometimes children, are like, we're going to do what all the cool kids are doing. We're going to play mage. So um, that's been a, a, a long-running chronicle of mine was, was rebooted. Um, and that's proven to be interesting. And I'm on the cusp of maybe trying to do a Changeling the Dreaming campaign, which um, I don't think I am up to. Um, as intimidating as the sphere system is, the uh, the theme and mood to me of Changeling is just something where I'm like, I don't know if I could do this or not. So we'll we'll, we'll see how that goes. But that's how I that's how I got into Mage. 
Well, that's, yeah, that's great. Uh, good luck with that uh, Changeling Chronicle. Uh, maybe you can tell us about that a little later. Uh, but to start off, uh, before we really get into the subject today, the progenitors, um, you and I were talking last week, and uh, you shared with me an idea for Paradox that I, th I thought was just great. Can you tell the audience about that? Sure. Um, I'm active on the Mage forums run by Onyx Path. Uh, my username is Philly Curiosity. And um, I like floating alternate mechanics. Uh, I think we all love the beauty of the world of Mage, but maybe the, uh, the crunch of it, the system, uh, isn't always as tight as we would like it to be. My problem with Paradox was always that it was seemingly random. Like, I understand that there needs to be a random element and whether or not it will occur, but I think a player should have some idea of what the risk-reward is. The idea of a Paradox pool being stored up and then just suddenly being unleashed excuse me, is, uh, was something that had my players absolutely horrified, even when they had a gun to their head, of using Volker magic. And, and that's not what we want. Um, so I, I am a big fan of the other White Wolf systems. I, I'm pretty familiar with uh, Wraith, Changeling, and Vampire, and even Demon and Mummy to a lesser extent. I'm a big fan of crossovers. Um, I was thinking in Wraith, there's a phenomenon uh, known as catharsis, where there is a, a duel between the two aspects of a character, their shadow, their dark half, um, and their psyche, um, or their Eidolon, their good half. And I was wondering, what would that look like in Mage? If under certain circumstances, either when a backlash were triggered or when a Mage were under exceptional duress, maybe their avatar takes over for a brief period of time. Um, so recently we had a case where a character... Um, primordi primordial essence um, was in a high duress circumstance and they just were not using magic. Their avatar tends to be more inclined. It's a, it's a mythic age component. This, uh, the, the character's avatar is like, no, 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 you're a mage. Magic is the solution to the problem. Um, so I had the character make a willpower roll. The character failed and their avatar took over for um, a short snippet of that scene. Um, the character accumulated a small amount of paradox, um, and there were a lot of bodies on the floor by the time they were done. And everyone else in the group is like, what just happened? Um, and I, I very much like scenarios where that can happen. I, I'm toying around with that being an alternative paradox backlash. The, the problem I'm running into is, in a lot of cases, what the mage does and what the avatar does would probably be the same thing. So to me, it is an option for when what the character does is very different, maybe, than what the avatar wishes the character to do. Um, if the, if a character has a static avatar, a static essence, um, the, the avatar's expression might be do what has worked previously, which can cause all sorts of problems. Likewise with, um, with questing, if the character is relying too much on a, a given rote, um, the avatar might in, in some way punish the character for their lack of creativity and so on. It's just a mechanism I, I'm batting around. I floated it on the forums, got zero responses, so... If anyone has any ideas and wants to uh, wants to forward that to us, I'd be glad to uh, to chew on it. Yeah, you can contact uh, any uh, of the co-hosts here by sending an email to magethepodcast at gmail dot com. And uh, if you just put a note uh, at the start uh, who you're addressing it to, then uh, we'd be happy to reply to that and uh, chew on it, as Terry said. Now, uh, when Terry was sharing his paradox idea, uh, my head got spinning too. I like the idea so much. Uh, I was thinking of uh, perhaps a more uh, low-key uh, approach to that. And uh, an example might be if a uh, storyteller and, and a uh, group of players uh, prefer to take the approach that the avatar is more of a, a subtle, uh, mysterious uh, background phenomenon, uh, less less direct, um, more difficult to contact and communicate with. And they might try the idea of when a mage accumulates uh, too much paradox and has not dealt with it, then when they are casting effects, then the forces of paradox would start taking a more active hand. And an example of that might be if a mage uh, creates a uh, matter effect, then whatever it is that the mage alters or creates would be, um, the effect would carry out successfully, but uh, the result would be very, very heavy or, or difficult to manage. Uh, another example might be if the mage is going to use forces to you know, lift up or, or somehow protect or help out a friend, then um, forces of paradox might take over and there would be some static discharge or minor burns or something like that. And they, this would cause no health levels of damage to the person being rescued, 
but the person being rescued would look at that mage and say, oh, this, this person doesn't have very good control of their magic. Uh, I'm, I might get hurt by this person accidentally if I cooperate with them too much. And, and so this is a more, more mild result. Uh, this would be um, less than a paradox flaw because, you know, if, if you start punishing the player in the scene uh, more, then basically you're just doing a, a paradox flaw. But it encourages a player to work out their accumulated paradox before things like this become uh, too frequent. But anyways, uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that idea, Terry. I, I like uh, uh, presenting a lot of different alternates and, and options uh, to our listeners uh, so they can work out uh, something on their own. Now, I would like to turn to the topic of today's episode, and that is convention book progenitors. And uh, I'm speaking about the first one, which was an early uh, first edition book for Mage. It had a number five on the uh, spine of the book. And uh, because this was the early days of first edition, uh, the two authors of this book uh, stuck to the um, uh, first edition Core's book, uh, uh, that book's view of the technocracy, which was more of a, uh, a menacing uh, villain group that was uh, mysterious in the background, um, uh, less of a sympathetic character, certainly not a player character option uh, to players of the game. The first edition technocracy was uh, very sinister. They had a lot of uh, uh, harmful plans for society and certainly for other mages that were not uh, within their own group. And this uh, shows through in the Progenitor's uh, convention book uh, quite clearly. We get a book that was written um, to be a villain source book and not at all a player source book. And so... Um, at some point in the future, uh, Terry and I will probably have a chance to talk about the technocracy in general and the first edition versus later approaches to that group. Don't want to get into too much detail now, but as I give this uh, review of the book today, I'm going to keep my mind in that uh, territory of you know, early first edition, uh, thinking of it as a villain source book uh, and not so much a player source book. Uh, did you get that same vibe when you were uh, reading the book, Terry? I very much got the feeling that there were a couple things that they were feeling out and they didn't quite pick one. Um, are you familiar at all with Werewolf the Apocalypse and the Entity of Pentex? Yes, I, I do have some familiarity with that. There were there was particularly one line on page 13. Uh, the masses will seek to medicate themselves with or without our help, as they have done for centuries. So we have done no wrong in applying our science to their urges. We have tried to atone for centuries of failing to wrest control from the traditions by buying the masses a little more sanity. And there was this, this warring sentiment back and forth. Um, it very much struck me that this was a book that was written by a step-parent who thought that they were not getting enough credit for what they did. Um, sometimes it was a case of um, uh, screw the masses. In other cases, it was they don't appreciate what we've done for them. Um, and it kind of had this spiteful uh, bend to it, and it didn't quite congeal. But, I mean, it's literally the first supplement we have for the technocrats, so I'm not really sure. Y you've got a bunch of stuff to work through. So to me, it felt like it was a little bit, um, a, a little bit uh, dissociative or dysphoric in terms of in terms of what it was trying to get across. Maybe that was a theme and mood thing in that the first 10 or 12 pages of background were very positive. And then by the way, it's like, we collaborated with the Nazis out of nowhere, or uh, we're trying to kill all sleeper avatars. And you're like, oh, okay, that's that's a bomb to drop. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, the book was uh, written very early on. And I, I got the impression that the two authors were striking out in divergent territory by you know describing this villain group, the technocracy, and they were concerned that they might uh, you know, get something wrong or uh, didn't quite know which direction they were supposed to take. And so I try not to be too critical reading through the book. And honestly, it's hard for me to tell how much was intentional and how much was just, you know, it just shook out that way. Uh, for example, the history section of the book, uh, I get the impression that uh, the point of view taken was uh, we are a, a very young group we formed you know just a few decades ago and uh, we are trying to make it look like we're this coherent ancient group that has existed since prehistory and we've only changed our name a few times and maybe that was intentional on the author's part or maybe it, it just kind of shook out that way it, it's really hard to tell at this late date oh yeah but on on the 
I guess one of the redeeming qualities of that is you have a little bit of material to pick which direction you want to go. Um, I mean, the reader would have to be like, oh, okay, this is this is a little bit dissonant. I'm going to pick this representation of it. Or even you could have multiple progenitors in a single group that don't quite agree on what their goal is. Um, as a storyteller, one of my goals for the technocracy, at least the second time, um, the cabal encounters them is to humanize it. I think my favorite example, I don't quite remember what book it was in. It was probably one of the early storyteller guides where their recommendation was have your characters meet uh, a man in black or a man in gray walking their dog. Um, <laughs> and the, the strong humanizing factor of like, crap, this guy has a pet. Uh Oh, um, and, and I kind of like the fact that the book may give, the, the dissonance there kind of gives opportunities to have um, a little bit of character for the characters who may be part of the convention. That's just, maybe that's apologetics, but um, that would be a direction I'd, I'd take it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I noticed reading through the book that uh, <clears throat> in the early pages of the book, there is a conscious uh, uh, section where one of the progenitors teaching the you know new progenitor students, uh, he starts talking about ascension, and, and he calls it ascension, and he says, hey, this is our view of ascension. It, it just seemed kind of heavy-handed and, and a little odd, but uh, you know, looking back in, in the very early days of Mage, uh, Ascension was one of those concepts that was uh, much spoken of in the core material, and so the authors probably had this impression that, oh, every faction of mages, every group of mages is going to have to uh, focus on ascension and, and talk about it and give their own view of it, which is different enough from the other groups to make it interesting. And, you know, years later, we look at the technocracy and most people take this approach of... Um, uh, ascension is a spiritual mystical term that mystics talk about and the technocracy uh, doesn't concern themselves with so much. They, they simply take this more general view of we want to, or at least we claim, to want to make society better, give people more opportunities, and that's close enough to um, lofty goals for us. We don't need to talk spiritual terms. Yeah, the other one that, that struck me was uh, the technocrats using... So this was before the... Um the alternative jargon, as I'll call it, emerged for the technocracy. Um, it was kind of a spectrum. Like early on, uh, the first two that, that leap to mind is in later supplements, dream is referred to as hypercram. And um, what's the other one that's different? Arcane is referred to as cloaking. Um, and this this book really had none of those. So it was interesting to me to see, uh, to see them refer to avatars as opposed to eidolons. Um, and a number of those other things. And now we bring the ball forward to Mage 20th edition, where literally every sphere has a alternative name. Um, so it's it's one of those cases where I kind of forgot my roots, and I was reading through it, I'm like, wow, they're using all the, all the default terms for this. They're not even using any of the technocratic terms because they hadn't been come up with yet. Yeah, they talk about awakening instead of en enlightening, and they talk about... Um... Mage instead of scientist with a capital S and, and a lot of stuff like that. So, yeah, it was certainly the early days. But uh, I'd like to turn now to um, a few details in the book, um, uh, discuss what the book offers readers and uh, what are some of the nice things uh, we saw in there. Uh, just to start it off, um, I think the book does its job in giving us the ranks um, of the progenitors like you know when you start out you're called this and as you move up the ladder you get different titles and responsibilities it described that it uh, gave us the uh, methodologies which is a term in mage for subgroups uh, within a convention of the technocratic union i described those it gave us um, some examples of um, magical effects that progenitors would use it gave us some uh, drugs that they create uh, some you know creatures uh, that they've created in their laboratories and uh, offered all of those up in a pretty small page count. Um, I, I can't remember offhand the, the actual page count of the book, but uh, the, it, it was not, you know, certainly a lot less than 100 pages. And so within that limited page count, I, I think they did a decent job of giving uh, a lot of uh, tools to a storyteller to, you know, bring these progenitors to life in Chronicles. And I do think they also uh, introduced what may be the most heinous act the technocracy committed, where they subtly implied that they were responsible for the death of Judy Garland. Um, yeah, it, it, the book clocks in at, what, 65, 66 pages, depending on how you count the endnotes. Um, I guess one of the, 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 the things that I found interesting, if we want to start diving into the individual sections, what struck me 
the most was how out in the open they were about everything. Um, th this is a book that I initially read in the late 90s, and it hadn't occurred to me that this is a the, – the, the character who is narrating this, the person whose diaries we are reading, um, is – taking courses at a public university, or at least a, uh, a non-strictly technocratic university. Uh, the character openly talks about the students that are not being necessarily recruited into the uh, progenitors that the, uh, the author is, is sharing classes with. I'm like, wow, this is really out in the open. Um, and that was probably one of the, the biggest surprises tone-wise to me. Um, I do like the fact that a lot of the the early books had a lot of one line throwaways. Um, for instance, they have the brief aside where they talk about how uh, Frankenstein's monster was was created by a son of Ether Mage. Um, they have the line later about how they essentially uh, timing the book. Um, they suggest that the progenitors were behind the rise of the supermodel um, to create this ideal to uh, to get people to to shill out money to pay for things. And one of the things that uh, first edition and a lot of the early books were really great at was those little one-line throwaways that make you go, oh, that's interesting. And then quickly make you go, wow, I really wish they had given me a system behind that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what, what are uh, some of the strengths you'd say in this book? Some of the things that it, it did well for um, a storyteller who's going to run a chronicle and wants to pull in the progenitors as NPCs. I think it did a good job of highlighting the gigantic difference between the tradition and technocracy in terms of the traditions are very much a set of warring factions, kind of, that they are a, a faction in the Ascension War, and even within that faction, they themselves do not often get along. Um, where I think this book did a great job of being, this, we are the progenitors, the, these are the three interlocking gears um, the facade engineers, the gen engineers, and the pharmacopoeists. Um, this is how we work together. And this is how we work together with other um, conventions and how we work together with other methodologies. Um, there was, I think it was Malcolm Shepard, um, did a live journal post to date it where he talks about the fact that in his head, Malcolm Shepard was one of the early White Wolf writers, how in his head the traditions and the technocracy were the same size in terms of raw number of awakened members that were active, and the technocracy was just better organized. And what this book does a very good job is saying, hey, we're the technocracy. This is our pipeline. We literally have classes that people can join. These are the products that we sell. This is if you do your work and you put in your time, this is how you're going to advance. This is how you work with your colleagues. These are some of the toys that you get to play with along the way. So I think, um, especially early on when that te technocracy was just this dark despair, black obsidian monolith. Um, of explaining, no, 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 this is, this is the benefit of order. Uh, in the metaphysical trinity, we serve stasis. This is the benefit of stasis. And I think it did a very good job of giving you, in a box, this is how you can present this group as being menacing, being omnipresent. They talk about the magical effects that they use and how that creates some of the, um, some of the standard tropes, like how cloning works or how body replacement works. Um, or how some of their, uh, their, their genetic pets are made. Um, and I think it does a, a terribly good job of doing that. Uh, it gives you a bunch of avenues to create subtle creep, where they suggest ways in which the progenitors are involved in the day-to-day -day lives of sleepers, in terms of like the products they do, where the businesses they run. I think in terms of mood and atmosphere, it's terribly helpful in that regard. Yeah, I, I found much the same thing. Uh, it Through the... Uh point of view character we get um, kind of a day in the life sort of information as we're reading through the book and as a storyteller I like that because uh, now I know the settings and the scenes uh, that you can paint when the player characters uh, you know intrude upon uh, one or more progenitors it's like well, well you know, what are they doing what kind of room are they in uh, what, how are they dressed you know just little details like that that a storyteller suddenly has to, to think of and this book really helps a storyteller understand what to present to the players how to set up a scene that the player character are going to crash into, and uh, I, I liked that. Um, I also really liked the uh, specific information it got into about how different conventions of the technocracy cooperate. They, uh, you know, supply uh, clone bodies to uh, Iteration X, for example, and uh, there's certain 
um, projects that they do together with the New World Order or the syndicate. And uh, yeah, that that was very helpful to see that um, these five conventions are actively working together. They've been doing it so uh, they've doing it been doing it for so long and so well that they have a pattern down they know what works and uh, it's a well-oiled machine you might say and that's what a lot of people would expect from the technocracy so it was nice to actually see some details there also the laboratory at the end of the book I, I thought that was just great for a storyteller who needs to quickly you know drop in a lab that the players are going to raid or bomb or, or whatever it's like oh here's a floor plan here's an idea of who's in it here's an idea of what's being done um, just terribly useful and I think graphically, um, at least in terms of graphics that would occur in a uh, in a chronicle, I very much like the fact that they introduced uh, non-standard ways of uh, harvesting quintessence, where you, you possibly have a scene where the technocracy is harvesting literally the lifeblood of someone in an effort to fuel this machine. Uh, the the I, I'm a big fan of coming up with a few set pieces inside of a inside of a chapter in a story and stumbling upon a place where there are a whole bunch of quintessence harvesting webs over people who are theoretically receiving some sort of palliative or long-term care. I think that's a, a scene that if properly painted can very much stick with your players as you slowly describe this glowing um, fluid emerging or dripping out of someone who appears to be uh, moments away from death. That's a, that's a real good way of saying, oh, maybe these guys aren't just, maybe they don't just have a different view of victory. Um, or alternatively, I, I, I like stories that focus around differences in themes. Um, and the technocracy is amazing at um, the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. Um, I, I could certainly see that scene counterbalanced with something where, oh, by the way, this quintessence is being used to maintain some sort of umbral barrier that is preventing this giant worm tainted creature from wreaking spiritual havoc on the city. What now? These people were going to die anyway. They have terminal cancer or what have you. How are you going to cope with this? What is victory going to look like for your characters? Okay, you destroyed this facility, but now there is a gaping hole in Earth's defenses against some sort of umbral menace. Um, and I, I just like the fact that they introduced alternative uh, mechanics for, for quintessence harvesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to turn now to uh, a few of the, the problems with the book, things that seemed a little odd or that Giant I, Hornet. I did not like as much. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, well, there a few things you, you mentioned a moment ago. I mean, as I was reading through the book, um, I, I had this you know, idea at the forefront of my mind. It's like, okay, they're presenting the progenitors and the, the, the two authors want us to know that they are a villain group. They are not someone where, you know, the reader and the player characters are going to be totally sympathetic with. Uh, they're supposed to be villains. But it seemed to me like they just tried too hard to make them villainous. Um, I mean, you mentioned already on, uh, on page 20, uh, they, they have the supermodel um, mention. And it's only just like, a few sentences, but it's like they're, the book is dropping all of these conspiracies and all of these uh, harmful things that the progenitors are doing, and, and this one just seemed so so odd to me. It's like, uh, the progenitors have made women that are abnormally beautiful and then heartlessly unleashed them on society, and now you see them on uh, fashion runways and on uh, magazine covers, and yeah, I could just picture a, a bunch of uh, you know teenagers saying, Oh my gosh, there's a bunch of pretty girls out there. It's a conspiracy. It's like that's a little too much for me. <laughs> yeah, the I, I did I did like that they um they suggested that the convention ran um the Center for Disease Control, which in the nineties was like one of the key targets. I guess I guess through the nineties, what would the three key government agencies for any good conspiracy have been? Uh, the NSA, the CDC, um, and maybe the FBI, thanks X-Files. Um, and it is weird <laughs> to be like, just as, as those groups in the early 2000s got way better at marketing themselves to the public and being, oh, by the way, we're mostly here to prevent actual disease. And people are like, oh, okay, that's cool. Um, it is weird to be like, oh, wow, this is this book is a child of the 90s. Um, yeah. And I, I th the... Uh, there were a few there were a few lines it it's it seemed like they were trying to use the i think the thing that gets got me is that the character's lack of empathy like that seemed to me to be the way in which they were trying to tell you that the characters are bad um 
that the the characters kind of the uh, the technocrats kind of shrug their shoulders and be like, ah, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, kind of thing. And that was their way of trying to show that these people were monsters. Um, and yeah, and some of it, especially the uh, the reference to Nazis, everyone take a drink. Um, yeah. always seems to be a little bit a little bit over the top. I think one of the weirdest ones to me was page thirty three, where they talk about how fairies. Of all the night folk among vampires and werewolves and rays and the traditions, fairies are the ones that we have to extinguish with the most prejudice. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Now, mind you, this book was written literally five years before Changeling the Dreaming would come out. I think Changeling the Dreaming came out in 98, and this was published in 93. Um, so, like, what... What version of fairies did they have such that, oh, no, you're a technocrat among the things that could possibly cause problems. They're the ones that need to be uh, crushed um, with with the most force. Uh, that was Yeah, that did come across as, as rather unexpected for me. I was like, well, good grief. Don't you have uh, bigger things to worry about? Well, yeah, it's it's it was kind of interesting um, as I there, there's another podcast, 25 Years of Vampire the Masquerade, um, and they talk about going through the books, how in the lead up to a new line being released, vampire books would start weaving it in. So before Mage was published, they had the idea of mages and they started saying, hey, this is what we think mages are going to be. Here are some powers you can use to kind of emulate what they do. But remember, a mage can do anything. Um, and sometimes there was a little bit of, uh, of of space between how they kind of previewed a um, a line and how it actually turned out. And this may be just another one of those. Alternatively, this could be a throwaway thing in the same way that Charles Reed has a particular hatred for the virtual adepts. I think it would be interesting if the person running the class uh, where where the information on the night folk were given had a particular hatred for fairies because of like one bad trip at college or something like that. And this is actually not necessarily the convention's viewpoint, but just the person conveying the information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moving through some of the things about the book that uh, I, f I found um, uh, kind of tr uh, tough for me to work through um, was a, a, they kept hitting this theme again and again. Uh, these guys are just so evil, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, for example, they mentioned that they were working with the Nazis back in you know, World War II time. And not only do they mention that, but they say it, uh, I think it's Dr. Reed, the older progenitor, who's talking about this in the book, and he's saying, oh, it was just such a great thing. We got so much great information, and uh, there's no mention of anything bad or controversial or anything. He just mentions it so... You know, pleasantly, that it's like okay, this this really does sound more sinister than you know. It's more heavy-handed than I think they needed to be. Uh, the deadening of sleeper avatars was mentioned more than once in the book. Uh, the progenitors have this large, long-scale project to smother the avatars of um, all of the general population so that uh, it will be harder for them to awaken, it will be harder for them to be uh, creative and troublesome and innovative, and that was a very early first edition uh, for me. It, it fit very well with this view of a um, large monolithic sinister technocracy that wants to prevent change and keep everything locked in stasis. Uh, other things that, that uh, stood out to me was they mention um, infighting between the five conventions of the technocratic union and I think they played it up too much. I mean it's like the progenitors again and again throughout the book it's like we're putting these booby traps and backdoor codes and, and secret things in here so that we can you know defeat the other conventions and make sure they never caused any harm to us and, and I was thinking to myself look these other four conventions of the technocracy they're not idiots. I mean, these are capable people. If you start putting in uh, bad things or, or setting traps for them, they're going to know it. I mean, when they get your clones or they get your drugs or, or other things from you, eventually they're going to figure things out. For example, the New World Order has a number of mages there that are very good with using and researching drugs. So they're not completely in the dark. If you give them some bad drugs, they're going to come back and say, hey, what are you guys pulling over here? So that that seemed a bit too much for me. I'd like to tone it down a bit um, in, in my games. I see if these five groups are fighting against each other so viciously, it makes it harder to explain how the technocracy has held together for so long and achieved so many successes. It seems like, gosh, if these five groups are infighting so viciously, they're going to break up the whole group. So I, I, I need to tone that down for my own chronicles. But other things that stood out to me, uh, there's a scene where a um, 
progenitor comes in and talks to the students about what the pharmacopoeists are doing. And I mean, they say in the book, he, he looks like Satan with no uh, the horns filed off, and uh, he's dressed uh, very richly, and he's selling drug illegal drugs out on the street and making tons of money and talking about how great it is, and he has no moral qualms about anything he's doing. It's like, wow, that that again, it's just so heavy-handed that it it, it seems kind of clumsy to me. Um, my biggest complaint was there's uh, a scene in the book where uh, three progenitor students are being uh, brought into the convention and one of them is this kid named Rob and he's uh, you know a nerdy geeky guy who's very intelligent very talented and he starts seeing these uh, big mistakes that the instructor is making in his presentations and so he calls it out in class and the uh, instructor gets, uh, you know, takes it personally and gets upset, and then in the middle of the night sends a monster to kill Rob and replaces him with a clone. And it's like, okay, that is just too heavy-handed. I mean, if you're killing off your own students that you're putting out so much efforts to recruit, and you know, as the books say again and again, there aren't many mages in the world. How is your convention going to be successful long term? If you know you you kill off your students over minor um, annoyances like that, it, it was it was too much for me. Uh, last thing that I would hit on is they present a horizon realm for a progenitor construct, and the part of the construct, the laboratories on Earth, uh, you know these make sense and they're interesting. They give a floor plan, etc. But then they talk about the horizon realm behind it, and there's very little information given. It, it's boring, basically. They, they say, oh, it's this really big building, and it's really clean. I mean, isn't that awful? It's so clean. And then they kind of move on. It's like, clean. Yeah, it's like, okay, so they have some janitors. I mean, what is so bad about this? But even beyond that, what is so interesting about this? I would not even use this Horizon Realm in any of my chronicles unless I rewrote the whole thing. Yeah, the, that, that Horizon Realm becomes a building in a larger Horizon Realm. Um, I do like the idea, though, kind of of a horizon realm that is strictly a building that when you look outside, you see nothing but like the void or something like that. But yeah, there's 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 a fair amount of forgiveness we need to give for the for the uh, writers. Just it's an awfully big setting and I constantly feel spoiled. Um, I got into an argument on the forums with someone. What would Mage look like if it had as many books as Vampire the Masquerade? Um, and someone's like, oh, aren't the book counts about the same? So I, I went through and I tried to uh tally that by my math there's about 70 mage books and there's 120 uh vampire books um th those counts go up a little bit if you include dark ages and to think like you are laying the seeds for what will be another 60 66 books after after you that's that's some heavy lifting um mm -hmm. do you mind if i go into i guess my gripes yeah i'd like to hear them sure the uh there were a few throwaway lines that really threw me off. I, uh, one was page 29 when one of the characters says, I myself have been killed four times before. Um, was <laughs> That was just, <laughs> just an oh, by the way. Yeah, um, I forgot that. Yeah. And it's one of those things where like, okay, if you've been killed so many times, maybe maybe you're not the best usage of resources. Or alternatively, <laughs> if it's really easy to clone someone, why not just make clone armies? Um, like... If you're going to clone someone and you have access to Life 3, why doesn't every cloned progenitor have five dots in everything? Why aren't they these 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 hyper-intelligent, like, pick the pinnacle of humanity? Um, and why aren't they all that? And you can come up with an in-story explanation that says, like, biological selection creates a refined entity that's a balance among their parts. And whenever you try and push everything to 11, uh, things start breaking down. It's kind of like the idea of, is... Captain America, a superhero, he's just the best humanity could possibly offer. Is that enough to be a superhero? I think Captain America's true superhero is that he's always right. Uh, his true superpower is that he's always right, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the way they present technology as a focus makes it look like a cargo cult, where um, like there are literally sections where they talk about like waving a uh, a test tube in front of something. I'm like, wow, this is... This is this is not. I don't feel like they did the lifting to say this is how hyper science could work. Um, that instead they're just like, oh, the the technocracy just uses different foci, which are more likely to be accepted by sleepers. Um, and in later books, you get a lot more detail about um, how a, a genetic amplification array would work, or some other fictitious piece of technology. Um, so when they went when they went down the list of uh, a foci per sphere, that felt me as as very 
almost shamanistic in the way they displayed it and being like, hold up this test tube and magic will spew forth from it and be like, eh, maybe we have to work our way through te- what techno magic actually is. Um, the, the creatures that they mention, um, I'm sorry, but unless, unless they explicitly state somewhere that they can absorb, they, they can soak lethal damage. Almost all of them are killed very quickly with shotguns. Um, that that may just be a, a hole in the system at that point, or maybe I forgot in first edition that you can soak lethal or something like that. But you start counting up the health things, and like two characters with shotguns can kill almost all of these things um, because none of them have proper armor. They just have like eight dots in stamina. Again, as a storyteller, you would probably tweak that to make um, the, the dragons um, that they have a little more resilient. I also like where they talk about three successes making a hornet 30 times larger, which by my math would take a one inch hornet and turn it into a 3.1 inch hornet, which is still comfortably something that I can swat with my hand. Um, I think they meant by a, uh, a factor of uh, 30 cubed, and then you get the giant uh, creature that they have. But I mean, I do math for a living, so <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the guy raising his hand in the back like, oh, your numbers don't quite add up, sir. Um, and I guess my final thing is just a commentary on the science. Um, so the Human Genome Project starts in 1990 and finishes in the early 2000s with the invention of uh, rapid um, shotgun sequencing. We very quickly learned that DNA was not an instruction manual. It was a recipe in the sense that if you look at a cake, you can guess what the ingredients are, but you cannot infer from the cake what the recipe was necessarily. And it's pretty well the same with genes that you can look at the organism. You can look at the, um, you can look at what's come out the other end. And from there, you cannot safely estimate or determine what got it there. Um, for instance, dogs, um, dogs are one of the most, uh, diverse of the large mammals in terms of appearance and, uh, genetics go selective breeding. Um, you cannot look at a dog in many cases and say it is definitively this breed. Uh, there's almost always a couple ways to get where you want to go. Um, I'm a fan of rescue pit bulls. And one of the big problems is people are like, oh, pit bull is a breed. I'm like, well, you can get something that looks very close to what you and I would call a pit bull um, if it starts out with this other breed, but there are just one or two changes. So there's a bunch of ways to get to Pitbull. And I feel like they, they talk about genetics as the key to unlocking all understanding of life, where we very quickly realize that that is just chapter one of the book of life and things like figuring out the proteome, um, figuring out how enzymes work, figuring out how epigenetics works. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Epigenetics. I read an article on that a while back and it's like adds a layer of complexity to things. There, there were, uh, genetic information in the cell that for years in my textbooks they were saying oh this is uh, useless material and uh, it's it's great proof of um, you know, evolution and then they move on and, don't, and then they later they discover epigenetics like oh we thought this was useless but actually this is an active part of what's going on yeah and that just reflected the state of the science at the time and this is something that we run into when we read like the virtual adepts book and you're like this is bleeding edge and this is where technology will go and i'll be like i don't know i know facebook is beyond a wet dream for the new world order and no one saw that coming seemingly Mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's there's a a number of points uh that that you hit on in that um and that kind of nudges me towards the the next section uh, for discussion and that was uh, just a general look at the uh, progenitors and the technocracy and some of the ideas presented. Uh, For example, you mentioned the uh, different uh, foci offered and how they they seem almost kind of shamanistic, someone who's saying, hey, you want to do something with time, well, pull a pocket watch out of your pocket and just do it. And yeah, it's like... Okay, I, I can see how that would be kind of clumsy and not very helpful for a, a storyteller and, you know, in a pinch who needs to pull out some halfway believable techno-magic effect. But at the same time, um, you need to look at how detailed you really want to get. Uh, I remember a lot of storytellers talking to me about how they feel pressure as a storyteller to understand so many different systems of magic, so many different paradigms, so many different... Uh, groups from real world history and culture and then on top of that they have to understand all these rule systems and all these things going on in the game and oh no somebody wants to play a shapeshifter now they've got to understand all this other stuff and it's like there's so much I've got to know there's so much to pull in can't I just hand wave a few things and and get on with it and so I 
tend to come down not not so very hard on some people and some storytellers who are saying, look, um, I hated science when I was in school. I, I don't like math. Um, I was I was a psych major. And can I just hand wave a few things and say that they're technomancers? And it's like, yeah, I, I get where they're coming from. And I don't want to criticize them too harshly. But yeah, on the other hand, some people are like, they really want some detail. They're comfortable with scientific ideas. And they, wouldn't it be cool if I could present more of that in the game? And then they read this and it's like, wow, this is so simplistic. But again, perhaps it's just the limited page count and the need to get this thing done by a certain deadline. So it's hard to reverse engineer that stuff. But yeah, you, you have a valid point. Uh, some of these things do come across a, a little poorly. They take the three different methodologies and they say, okay, here's some different um, uh, magical effects that they might do. And, and some of them look awfully similar to each other. And so it's like, well, did you really need to present all of these? But um, yeah, a lot of things going on in the book. You, you present, I mean, you mentioned the uh, the hornet, and some people would say, hey, you know, these are these are technomages or technomancers. Um, they are supposed to use uh, halfway believable uh, science and technology in their magic, and uh, you know, suddenly making a hornet jump to much larger than its size and then running away in the confusion. I mean, that's not scientific. That's not technological. That's obviously magic and. You know, from my point of view, I'd say, well, all mages in the world of mage uh, can use coincidental and vulgar magic. And so when, you know, you can't take away the ability to use vulgar magic from technocrats. So when they do it, yeah, it's, it's vulgar. It's obviously um, something strange and unusual. And um, you, you shouldn't, uh, you know, put an iron lock on that and say, no, they must be 100% believable all the time or you're playing a different game. And uh, the super advanced science of the uh, technocrats, I mean, really one of the themes of mage is that magic is real and people approach it in very different ways and people have uh, tried to manipulate it to their own uh, point of view and their own goals. And uh, the hyper science of the technocrats is, is really magic that they are trying to make look like science. And so, yeah, this this uh, super giant uh, wasp um, done in an emergency situation when our progenitor is trying to escape, it's like, yeah, I'm okay with that as a storyteller. I, I wouldn't say no, that, that stretches everything and makes the progenitors look bad. Uh, they are really mages trying to make trying to look like scientists. Uh, one of the interesting ideas you can play with if you are using um, technomancers a lot in your chronicles or technocrat uh, player characters is this idea that when a new technocrat is is trained and brought into the fold then they are told that yeah everything is scientific we're just really good at it and then as time goes by they start to slowly see that hey uh, I've been deluding myself we're really doing magic and calling it science and then by the time they get to a really high arete and very powerful uh, they reach the point where they have to make a decision and say look do I want to live the lie uh, for the greater good and for convenience and just say we are not mages, we are scientists and, and force myself to adhere to that point of view. Or am I ready to walk away from the technocrats, uh, maybe join the oracles or strike out on my own because I can no longer deny the fact that we're doing magic and pretending we're doing science. See, I, I guess this is interesting. I, I've always had a fundamentally different view of it um, that the technocrats realize the malleability of reality, technocrats, capital T, understand the malleability of reality, and they are trying to figure out what is the way in which we can most firmly embed into reality um, a set of practices and beliefs that are repeatable um, and that can be accessed by the sleepers. Um, so they understand that they are doing magic, but by calling it science, their goal is repeatability, uh, internal consistency um, and accessibility, I guess. Um, so they, they understand that they, at, at the early levels, they feel like they are just discovering the laws of the universe, where at higher levels, they more thoroughly recognize we are discovering and then set, we are setting and then discovering a set of laws to the universe that are going to have these attributes that we think is the best for both our motives and what we think is best for the sleepers. So I guess there's a little there's a little twist there for me in that they understand what they're doing, but they are going about it to me in a fundamentally um, in a in a fundamentally different way. Yeah, 
that that is an idea that was brought in more in uh, later editions and later yeah. years of Mage, and that is a dynamic that uh, is is really good to discuss in the games. I don't see the two concepts, you know, what I said and what you said as being mutually excuse, exclusive. Uh, the technocrats uh, look at magic and they say, uh, if we can make this a part of everyday life, then we can tame this wild energy and make it good for society and uh, at the same time making our enemies uh, have a harder time. And so uh, that dynamic is such that um, they are giving powerful tools to the sleepers, making it practical and useful to them, and that is why they've been so successful, and the conventions are not as good at that. It's like they want to use arcane, powerful magic and then try and bring sleepers in, but uh, there's only so many sleepers that they can convince to yeah. use it that way. And so ultimately, they the uh, uh, traditions are creating more of this elitist system where you've got mages or priests or whatever at the top and then the common people below. But hey, it's okay because it's for everybody's greater good. And you know, the technocrats are saying, no, 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 we don't like that kind of uh, elitist thinking. We like everybody to be in the same boat. That's why we have so many uh, acolytes and unawakened uh, technicians who are using the lower levels of our magic in everyday life. I would be curious, though, to see a, a chronicle or a character that is going through nor normally when I see a technocrat converting um, to one of the traditions, the, the 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 reason is usually because they are not comfortable with the methods. They think the the technocracy is is too willing to cause collateral damage or they're suppressing too much information. I would be fascinated to see one where a character suddenly realizes that what they're doing is not that, that science is not discovering the, the, the laws of reality in a way that is agnostic to the practitioner, but realizes, no, 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 this is just one of hundreds of ways to truth. And that winds up shaking their foundations. Like, I wonder if there's a period in technocratic progress where uh, control or whatever the internal um, policing organization needs to be super focused on on how this person is doing like maybe maybe an arete between four and five is where a technocrat is at their most vulnerable and i would be curious to see how something like that would play out i think that would be really neat yeah i, I think that would be neat too yeah the the world of mage is so wide open that it offers so many different points of view so many different interpretations that a person could take that uh sometimes when you think about it it's so exciting there's so much i could do and then at other times you think about it it's like oh it's so confusing and there's so much here and how can i do a good job as a storyteller and yeah that's uh one of the things that all of uh all of the co-hosts uh here at mage the podcast are, are trying to help the listeners with and that is uh grappling with this large uh confusing uh, chimerical um thing called mage the ascension and trying yeah. to uh break it down and saying hey it doesn't have to be an impossible philosophical puzzle we can make this into a, a great game that uh our players can enjoy but uh moving on you did uh mention how uh, the progenitors are so good at cloning, why don't they just uh, produce a clone that uh, is able to use, you know, effectively, sphere magic, or we technocrats would say enlightened science. And that that's a really good point. Uh, you've got the guy who dies four times, and when his clones come back, they can do enlightened science. But then you've got the student Rob. He's killed off, and his clone comes back, and it cannot do enlightened science. And so he becomes, uh, the clone becomes a minor excuse me, technician in someone's laboratory. And so I, I think the book should have at least tried to say to the readers, um, this is why we didn't do the obvious thing and clone um, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, you know, enlightened scientists who can come out of the clone tank and, uh, you know, use sphere magic and take over the world. I mean, uh, not just a, a major a victory for the technocracy, but the progenitors specifically. I mean, they, they should be running the whole show if they produce a clone army of, of mages, but they haven't done that. And of course, the reason they don't do that is because it would upset the whole game and we, we wouldn't be able to play Mage the Ascension, really. Yeah. But uh, they, sh they should say in the setting, why haven't you done this? You know, yeah. just 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 tell us something. Give us a little something here, because uh, you know that can be very interesting. To, I I would like to see some minor aside where one or more progenitors are having like the serious discussion, saying, "Hey, if we can produce such good clones, 
if we can learn this high-level enlightened science and do amazing things with it, why haven't we created, you know, clone after clone that can use enlightened science and use this as a major edge to, uh, you know, advance our goals? Um, I, I'd like to to see that. That could be very interesting. Uh, not just to explain why they haven't taken over, but I mean, like, as a as a concept for progenitors to grapple with as they move forward in their super science. Yeah, I, the the same thing comes up. I in I, I can't remember what other text, but. Um... In terms of it being a game-breaking mechanic, you brought this up in your episode on the Book of Chantries, where if mages are more likely to create other mages, why isn't there this tradition breeding program to yeah. uh, to try and come up with it? And and you can come up with a whole bunch of in-world solutions to that, um, but it's nice to proffer one. Um, yeah. And, and my feeling here is they address it in, I can't remember what other book, but they talk about premium. Um requiring access to matter five and a nuclear blast furnace. Um, so that very quickly says, oh, okay, these guys are pretty powerful, but they're not omnipotent. If they were, they would have already won the Ascension War. This is very resource intensive. And to say that like, okay, we get to clone, we have the facilities to clone 50 people a month. We need to be super specific with what with what fifty we want to choose, and we have a couple that we keep on hold. That the the machinery to do this requires essentially life five and mind five. Um, I, I don't think, in, in terms of system consistency, the two that threw me off were Prime One was used for the enhanced drugs. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and the, the cloning process in most other cases usually involves some element of spirit to reconnect the avatar. Um, but that was kind of absent here, but again, early systems, it, it, it happens. Um, that's, that's probably one of the most annoying aspects as you go over 20 years of a system to seeing how, what sphere requirements change kind of, uh, kind of move forward. But yeah, me too. I would have liked a little bit of discussion of that. And maybe it just didn't come up to the authors. Um, I, I, early on, what was it? They had a publishing schedule of trying to get out 10 books a year at their peak. I, I can certainly have some sympathy for trying to keep up with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, before I get to a few, uh, story ideas, I wanted to mention another thing I noticed in uh, a very small, uh, number of, uh, pages, they presented, uh, you know, creatures, monsters, basically that you could put into your, uh, chronicles. And, uh, I thought it was rather clever how in such a short space they presented, um, uh, monsters that were very monstrous, very, um, um, fantastical and way out. Uh, they also offered uh, monsters that were basically uh, very intelligent cats or dogs that take, you know, memorized notes and then snitch on you later. And then in between, they, they had the sort of middle ground where it's like uh, cre creations that look like animals, but then they can pop out wings or pop out, you know, some unusual feature and suddenly become an interesting monster. And I thought that was clever of them to do because there are a number of people out there um, who are going to run a chronicle of mage and they say oh i want to have progenitor creations that crawl out of clone tanks and look like you know uh you know lovecraftian monsters because that would be so cool and then you've got these other storytellers who are saying oh please don't turn my chronicle into a saturday morning cartoon i want this to be very subtle and nuanced and sinister and realistic and and so it's like okay you want that you can have that you want the other thing you can have the other thing hey we'll give you a middle ground we've got uh, a cat that looks ordinary but it has this frog tongue that can like suddenly grab things out of people's hands we've got a chihuahua that looks normal but all of a sudden it sprouts wings and it's flying around the room and you can have the verbena who you know breaks into the lab saying to the progenitor i'll get you and your little dog too or was that <laughs> wizard? maybe that was wizard of oz i can't remember but anyways uh, the point is it, it was neat that they offered um in, in such a small space the whole gradient of uh, wacky monsters to realistic monsters and a few in the middle take what you want leave the rest have a good chronicle uh-huh that they give you they give you everything from infiltration to a tank Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, the big reminder is the fact that, yeah, they, their, their magic is not necessarily as flashy. They can't necessarily, uh, cast a fireball just using forces three prime two, but with a little bit of planning and access to technology, you can have all these other things on tap and that a, a having a, a technomancer as a foe or specifically a technocrat is your cunning and your power versus their planning. And that is often a very unfair fight. Um, yeah. And it gives you a very good idea of, oh, no, 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 no. In Revised, the the Ascension War has effectively been won by the technocracy. Partially, here's why. And I think they do a very good job of giving a healthy uh, 
impression of this is how powerful planning is. Imagine what the traditions could do if they were able to work together better. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great theme to uh, reinforce uh, when you're running Chronicles. But to sum up my view of the book, uh, if someone were to ask me, hey, you know, in a sentence or two, uh, what do you think of this book? I would say good but not great. I, I liked it, but it's hard for me to get really enthusiastic about it. Would I recommend it to another storyteller? I would say, well, uh, if you want to pull in um, a, a progenitor lab or some progenitors or get an idea of um, the drugs they might use, which are hard to come up with whole cloth. And yeah, this is a useful book. But uh, if you're kind of feeling iffy about it and uh, you're feeling like, well, you know, I, I could supply a few of these things on my own, then yeah, you can live without this book. Um, it, it's not vital that you pick it up if you're running a technocracy um, uh, based chronicle so how what would be your general summation my my rule of thumb like if i were to come up with a on a, on a scale of one to five dots or whatever stupid system we want to use to review books <laughs> mine would be if i hadn't if i didn't already have this book how discounted would it need to be on drive through rpg for me to buy it um and i got it as part of technocracy assembled i have the dead tree copy that i picked up in 98 or something like that um and when I went to do this, when you were telling me this is the review we were going to do, I'm like, hey, we, I want an electronic copy. It's 30% off. Okay. I think that was reasonable. I get this. I get two other convention books for, yeah. uh, for seven or eight bucks. Good it's deal. certainly good there. The big thing for me that I really appreciate about these books is just the fact that a lot of the earlier books had a lot more sample characters in them. And as a storyteller, that's what I find invaluable. I would have paid $4 for just all the technocrats and um, a little bit of their background information. The, the, the thing that impresses me about the writing is how quickly in the role-playing notes section, three sentences can give you an amazing view of what a character is. Um, the, it was odd that they didn't give any information, they didn't give any dots or anything for Charles Reed, um, but Chains, Smith Nevins, uh, uh, the, the masochistic woman who keeps a stable of men, uh, Gina, I can't recall the last name of the character. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I find all of those to be to be useful to no end. So to me, this is partially a case of uh, in in experiments. If you offer someone fifteen pieces of uh, fine china or sixteen pieces, and one of them is broken, um, they will consistently value the sixteen piece with the broken one less, despite the fact that it is equal to or strictly more than the other one. So for mm -hmm. me, if you had said. Terry, I'm going to ask you to pay $5 for all of these pre-made characters, this pre-done construct. I would have been like, take all of my money. Um, <laughs> so, so, so from that avenue, it, is cert it was certainly worth it to me. I would put this in the, in the $4 to $5 category. It comes with the two other uh, technocracy uh, conventions. I would have no, no difficulty paying $8, $9 for the whole thing on drive through RPG. So yep, I would put this I in the 33% off category. <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds great to me. Okay, well, um, I have been told by the show's producer that in the past uh, we were able to offer some adventure ideas to listeners on Mage the Podcast, and uh, we got some positive reaction from that. And so uh, in that vein, um, I wanted to offer a few ideas for using progenitors in a Mage Chronicle as enemies or allies. And uh, before I offer um, a few ideas that I have, I wanted to start with a hint for uh, storytellers out there, especially uh, new storytellers. Uh, a lot of times they want to use the progenitors to uh, clone or plant an NPC in with the uh, player characters, and this NPC is going to be a spy or a traitor that turns on them. And a lot of times the mistake that storytellers make is they have very few NPCs that they spend any amount of time detailing as they're running their chronicle. And so when there's only one or two NPCs and then one of them turns bad, then in the future, uh, every time um, the player characters get to know an NPC, uh, they get gun shy and start thinking, oh no, he's, he's going to be a traitor. I'm not going to trust him with any information. I don't want to talk to him too much. I'm going to keep him at arm's length. And so my advice is, if a storyteller will spend a good amount of time detailing, uh, f say, four or five NPCs, 
and um, letting the players, you know, get to know them and, and let the players know that, hey, they're there, they're doing this for you, and they have this kind of personality, and the players kind of get comfortable with that. And then one of them turns into a traitor, then it, it can be done, uh, it can be much more effective in your chronicles, and it will not cause you problems trying to introduce NPCs in the future. Uh, so, you know, of course, uh, more experienced storytellers already know this, but uh, some of the uh, younger uh, or newer uh, storytellers, I, I see them making this mistake again and again. So just wanted to mention that. But I'm going to light into a few uh, ideas that I've got. Then I'm going to turn it over to Terry and let him um, offer any ideas that he might have. And um, then we'll wrap up the show and uh, let everybody get back to uh, what you were doing. So first off, uh, I had this idea, what if a Nefondus... Uh, somehow um, dupes a progenitor into culturing and then releasing something nasty into uh, the sewer system or into the uh, air of a neighborhood, uh, perhaps as some kind of a super science uh, bacteria or virus or um, very small, you know, insect-like uh, arachnid-like creature, something like that that causes harm uh, to uh, the general population. And now the players have learned about it but they don't understand enough science or they don't have the scientific equipment to effectively deal with this awful thing that's been released on the public. And so they have to cooperate with progenitors to uh, find the best way to detect this harmful uh, uh, entity and neutralize it. And so then you can move into this dynamic of you've got the players working with NPC progenitors. Uh, can they trust each other? Or, or is, is one group going to backstab the other towards the end? I thought that might be something uh, fun to play with. Uh, next one is uh, players, uh, some player gets stuck by a, uh, stuck with a needle um, a hypodermic syringe by a progenitor and now all of a sudden he's got something in his body but uh, he doesn't really you know notice anything unusual he's not getting sick or dying or anything and uh, before long there are technocrats that are coming to attack the player characters but there are other technocrats showing up suddenly who are defending the player characters. And so, of course, the players are going to be very confused. It's like, oh my gosh, this, you know, our friend has something in him that is very valuable, but uh, the technocrats both want to destroy it and want to defend it. What is this thing? Uh, this must be something very interesting. So, so the, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, not a problem. As I read that, is this just the plot to inner space? Because if so, I think that's amazing. I did see that movie years ago. I was kind of thinking of the opening, uh, one of the opening scenes of that movie. But, uh, of course, I, I was imagining a very different ending for a Mage Chronicle than for that movie. But, oh, but yeah, yeah, you picked up on that. You picked up on that. But uh, uh, So, basically, to, to finish that one off, um, players have to determine uh, what's going on, not only in their friend's body, but what's going on in the technocracy. There are factions moving against each other. Can they find out what's going on? And if they can find out what's going on, can they manipulate these factions against each other for their own benefit? And of course, how can they get whatever it is out of their friend so he can get back to his life? Um, uh, also, this is a good opportunity for a storyteller to change the backgrounds for the player who got stuck with the needle. I mean, you can raise them or lower them based on what was introduced into this player's uh, body. So to move on to the next one, uh, what if a virtual adept uh, comes to the player's cabal and he's uh, dying of some awful disease, either the technocrats did it to him or he just picked it up in the umbra or, or natural causes, and he says to them, hey, I, I need to get into a uh, progenitor uh, medical device or something like a cloning tank. Uh, I remember in Star Wars they had these great big glass uh, tubes that a person would get in just, just to heal, not to be cloned. Back to tank. Yeah, that one. So... <laughs> The, the uh, virtual adept comes up to the players and he says, look, I, I, I need to, um, to heal. Uh, we virtual adepts do not have this equipment, but we know about it. So can you help me break into a progenitor lab and uh, after, after that, uh, defend while my virtual adept buddies you know, run the machinery and, and get me healed up? And so um, I thought that might be a fun uh, short story that you can uh, introduce into a chronicle. And it's a great way for the player cabal to make alliances with the virtual adepts that they could take advantage of in the future. And let's see, the last idea is uh, a bit bit more of a, an odd one. Uh, let's say that the players learn that there is a progenitor lab that is well protected in a horizon realm, and these progenitors have unwittingly cloned the body uh, from the cloned a body from the remains of a powerful marauder. 
And so the progenitors don't really realize what they've got themselves into because this marauder is either going, the clone is going to recover and wake up and be a full-powered marauder and cause problems, or perhaps uh, the, the spirit, the um, essence of the marauder is going to find its way, uh, make a bee beeline to its own clone body and uh, possess that body and you know come back to life. And so it's going to wake up in this horizon realm and cause all kinds of problems. And the players find out about it before it happens. And so can they contact the progenitors or can they break into this uh, horizon realm laboratory and deal with the situation uh, perhaps there's a group of marauders that have found out about this and they're planning to break into the horizon realm and uh, do a rescue and so are the players going to sit back and say oh they're progenitors let their lab get trashed this will be awesome or are they going to say hey this you know this lab is connected to a lot of things that are going on on Earth, and so if these marauders trash the laboratory, that's going to have collateral damage that's going to show up on Earth and affect a whole lot of people. Maybe we should take a more active role here and try to uh, prevent uh, some problems. So that basically sums up the ideas uh, that I had. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Terry. Uh, did you have any ideas or any comments? Yeah, I had one or two. One, I really like the inner space idea. I think it would be absolutely fascinating to have. I, I think it's useful. It's the world of darkness. Um, for me, my chronicles tend to be it's the world of inky grayness. Um, everything is not lost. Everything is just a little bit harder. Um, where if no one does anything, things just kind of get worse, as opposed to if no one does anything, things kind of stay the same. So I really like having in a chapter or a longer arc, having one or two sessions that very much change mood. And I think Micromages could be a really fun one shot, one session. Oh, we're, we're in, we're literally inside of a hermetic. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and you have micro technocrats that are in there and you're fighting over the whatever, whether it be this gene sequence or the or you're trying to prevent the spread of these nanobots. Um, I, I think that could be that could be super fun. So if you hear me talking about that six months from now, uh, please take all possible credit for it. And all, <laughs> all Internet points will be yours, Adam. Um, to me, the technocrats, I, I think, are never at their best when they are just the bad guy. Um, whenever my characters encounter the technocrats, I want it to be mood appropriate. And I want the technocrats to be presented as the technocrats. They are not the Nefandi. They have fundamentally different goals and what they do should further that. Um, so for instance, mood wise, one of my favorite ones is the characters kill the same character six or seven times where it's essentially a repeated boss battle. You could have a reasonably potent uh, awakened opponent, and how dispiriting is it to literally see the exact same foe again and again? And if they're a high-level progenitor, that makes perfect sense. That mm -hmm. you very quickly have the ability to create this image of an unstoppable army when what really it is is judicious application of resources. Um, the other case I like to do is the progenitors are doing something useful. Uh, for instance, you get a tip on a progenitor lab that is doing um, xenotransplantation, which is uh, doing transplants across species or across entities. Um, you get some tips that it's being done uh, in this particular area. You break in and you find out it is literally uh, progenitors practicing uh, transplant technology on, if you really want to pick a sympathetic group. They're literally practicing on war veterans, as in there is no downside to this facility, um, except for to say it does advance progenitor science. Down the road, this technology could be used for them to create um, super powerful uh, agents or what have you. But for now, it is literally just helping war veterans. I think that puts the players in a super uncomfortable space. And I think that is a very good place to put your players in. Uh, likewise, you have a the, the quintessence harvesting that I mentioned earlier where uh, there's a palliative care facility where um, the, uh, the, the quintessence is being harvested to prevent some sort of umbral entity from breaking through. Um, I think that's a that's a good moral decision for players. Um, and you can you can turn that knob up or down where you can have this quintessence being used for something trivial or something uber important. And that will let you as a storyteller kind of dial it in. Um, I do like the breaking and entering chronicles where uh, your characters need to retrieve an experimental drug uh, so that one of their NPCs can uh, recover from an otherwise um, either supernatural or untreatable by mortal science illness. 
um, and maybe it is resistant to to traditional life three or what have you, or maybe life three is outside the ken of what the mages have access to, or the the mortal themselves would would make any magic used upon them vulgar with witnesses. Um, mm-hmm. So you need to come up with a solution that would fit within the paradigm. I also think it's useful to have a little bit of menace. Um, and this could be a case where there is a new marketing campaign for a cosmetic line, and it is everywhere um, in the advertising for whatever setting that you have. Um, and you discover that it's that it's the progenitors are behind it. And if you want to come up with something menacing behind it, fine. But I think it is useful to have a periodic reminder of, no, 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 no. This is literally just a money front for them. Or alternatively, this is literally them just releasing a new and improved product of some sort. Um, this is a mechanic I haven't played with before, but I could picture one of the characters becoming addicted to um, awakened or enlightened drugs. Um, and your, your character, one shot, uh, they're dealing with an NPC that's like, oh, this fight is getting, uh, is getting messy, take this. Um, they, they, they no longer take wound penalties for the remainder of combat. Their strength and their dexterity uh, both increase by one, or their strength and their stamina both increase by one. Heck, give them an Arite bonus, but the character becomes addicted. Um, so now you have a character that either needs to score or alternatively deal with the side effects of this. For those uh, playing along at home, you'll notice that this is nearly identical to the mechanics behind a mage consuming vampire blood. Um, and I have I have no problem with, with ripping that off and just saying, no, 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 we're going to have an enlightened drug that does the exact same thing. Um, I think those are, those are options if you want to jam a progenitor into your campaign. Um, I also think it's useful because of their ability to bring in the weird. So you go into a uh, progenitor facility and the floor is being cleaned literally by the carpets. Um, They emit a digestive enzyme that consumes it and uh, pulls the dirt back into it. I think having something a little bit menacing can be super helpful. Uh, Do a little bit of homework on that one. Um, I I have found that almost all chronicles are improved by getting lost on Wikipedia for a a short amount of time. Um, (laughs) the, The open questions in biology um, have given me a bunch of ideas on how progenitor um, magic could work. Um, it gives you a lot of blank space in which you can set hyperscience. So if, if a mechanism or a concept is literally unexplained so far, that's a perfect place for the technocrats to say, well, this is how it works. And there, there's your hyperscience that, that is both consistent with um, what we know and fits perfectly into a, a technocratic paradigm. Well, those are some great ideas. I especially like the mention of the magic-boosting drug that can cause addiction. I can see a lot of potential for use in a long-running chronicle with that one. And on the subject of drugs, I wanted to mention that in Anders Mage Page 2.0, there is an article where Anders Sandberg himself, a few years back, uh, created some drugs that can be used in Mage Chronicles, and he even included uh, rules mechanics for how those might work. Those can be found on Anders Mage page 2.0. Just click on Factions, and then Traditions, and then Cult of Ecstasy, and uh, there's a short list of articles. You'll see one on Drugs in Mage. Uh, Worth a look, uh, certainly worth reading over. Well, with that, we are coming to the end of another episode of Mage the Podcast. I want to thank Terry Robinson for joining us today in this uh, great discussion on the progenitors and their place in the technocracy. I was a little tempted to uh, veer into a discussion on uh, old technocracy versus new and how people interpret those for their campaigns. But, you know, that can wait for the future. Uh, For now, I just want to uh, let everyone know that you can find us online at magethepodcast.com. Also, you can follow us on Twitter, at Mage the Podcast, and please subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes. If you give us a review on iTunes, that uh, improves our visibility, making it a lot easier for other people to find us uh, during their own searches on iTunes. So uh, please consider doing that if you'd like to help out the show. You can also find us on Google Play and the TuneIn app. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for listening today. This is Adam Simpson and Terry Robinson from Mage the Podcast, signing off. Bye.